The customers fight back. The Sonos meltdown. This week on Future Forward. Ben in Seattle, an experiment in voting online. And is the future of AR in contact lenses? We'll investigate. I'm Alexis Cordato. And I am Stephen Rosenbaum. Let us launch. Hey, Alexa. Hey, Steve. So we were talking before the pod, and we, we really do need to, before, before we get into tech, we have to talk about some people because uh, there is a there is a series of sad stories, and they all kind of, you and I both agree they add up to something. So you you, you go first. I'll 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 chime in. I just this uh, the last few days. So Layla Jana, the CEO and founder of Samosource, passed away from cancer at age 37. Clayton Christensen. Uh, I don't know, a, a scholar, an author, a management guru, um, passed away also from cancer at age 67. And then uh, today, just a few hours ago, heard the news that Kobe Bryant passed away with his 13-year-old daughter uh, in a helicopter crash. And they're all related, right? These are larger-than-life people that, that, that literally, you know, lived in a bigger world than most of us. Uh, I mean, may, maybe start with the story of Layla, because first of all, she's the youngest, but secondly, I did not, I did not know her story and you shared it with me and it was, uh, it was uh, startlingly uh, intense. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, female founders has always been a, a story that I've, I've tracked uh, my career and she was someone who, um, yeah, she started an AI company, uh, I think 10 years ago, Samosource, and uh, which, um, you know, really, which also leverages um, talent in East Africa. And so think about tasks that are more complex than Mechanical Turk. Um, but it's, uh, again, if you sort of look at the company, it, it was like, I feel like it was ahead of its time. And obviously, having worked at a company like Andela, which obviously is also making a tremendous investment in the continent, I mean, she was, uh, she sort of saw an opportunity to not only invest in a new technology, but really invest in the potential of, of people. Um, so she was inspiring to me. And then, you know, a few years ago, I, I saw Clayton Christensen speak at a conference and he told me that management, uh, or being a manager is one of the most noble professions because you wake up every day and your job is to see the best in others and help people uh see their own true potential and and to express that and i had never heard any person wax poetically about being a manager in the way that he did um and so that was amazing to see in person so the lesson learned from all of these three people and from how it hit both of us is, you know, you really have to cherish life and live it to its fullest because you never know when your version of the helicopter is going to drop out of the sky. I mean, totally. And this entire podcast is about the future. And I think what shapes the future and, and what is possible, it's, it always comes with these individuals who have the courage to see the way things are for what they could be instead. So we're going to do the show in three chapters today. We're going to start with Sonos. Then we're going to talk a little about elections and electronics. And then we're going to do a piece that our friends at IEEE reported about contact lenses and AR. But but let's just jump right in and and talk about Sonos. Um, Are you a Sonos user? So I was gifted a Sonos probably five years ago. So I have an older edition, but I never invested in multiple Sonos speakers. Sonai? Sonai. (laughs) Sonai. So, but, but, but the one you have, like, are you fond of it? Do you like it? Is it a good piece of technology? Oh yeah. I think it sounds great. It's easy to set up. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a great product. So I have never used one and, and I am an audio person, but have a big stereo system in my living room and didn't want to have to trade it out. But also, I mean, Sonos is expensive, right? Like it's not a little commitment. I, I mean, mean, this the, little speaker is, you know, it was two hundred fifty dollars at the time. Yeah, before, you know, the 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 device whose name we cannot mention. 
and yeah. uh, and Google and all that stuff. Uh, but but they have been in a battle, particularly with Google and arguably with you know Amazon as well, uh, as these big companies woke up and said some number of years ago, hey, we think maybe we'll build speakers. And right. Do you? I mean, I, I I vaguely. So there's two things going on. One is the Sonos. A Google lawsuit, which we'll talk about, and then also a kind of a user uprising that's interesting as well. Um, the Google lawsuit is interesting in part just because it seems so unlikely to be successful. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I who knows what happens in these closed door meetings with decision makers, but I do find it optimistic to kind of go after these big tech giants just because they have all of the legal capacity known to man i think i mean but but it raises this larger question which we've been talking about on the pod over the last couple of months but this kind of brings it home a little bit which is you know for all startups is the outcome at the end of the rainbow either you get acquired by one of these three or four companies or you go out of business like is you know yeah so i it, it's funny that this is happening because I want to say a few years ago, right before the Spotify IPO, my hope was that um, Sonos and uh, Spotify would actually just do a joint merger um, because I felt like the software plus hardware component gave both Spotify and Sonos the best possible chance of competing long term with the likes of Google and Apple. So I guess I, it's funny. I, I thought about that as well. And my answer was better for Spotify to be ubiquitously on all platforms than because the minute that they had a hardware competitor, they would essentially be, you know, you know, Google and Apple and Amazon would all say in different ways, you're dead to us. You know, oh, we, we're not going to support your app because now you're a competitor in the, you know. I think there are two axes, like from a strategy standpoint, that every company has to evaluate, which is uh, platform and then distribution. And so if you have the hardware platform and then you have the software, like you can't just have sort of your own thing. I think it is like strategic partnerships and alliances are going to form no matter what. And so I, yes, like, Initially, Sonos sort of having its own um, being Switzerland and, and neutral uh, sounds great. But as Apple, Google, Amazon start acquiring their own content, right, it actually then um, makes Spotify less appealing. It's so, like the streaming wars that we always talk about. So the lawsuit that Sonos filed early, first week in January was in two federal co court systems, and they're seeking financial damages and banning the sale of Google speakers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, and, and they essentially say that Google is infringing on their on five of their patents. Um, I mean, all Google really needs to do is just slow roll that lawsuit for the next three to five years and right. and Sonos will be out of business, right? I mean, right. that's, you know, and 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 so Sonos, so here's the user uprising. Sonos came out with a new generation of, of software and hardware and essentially announced that it was going to, you know, let its older users float off to sea and not be backwards compatible to a number, I don't even frankly know where the line is in the sand, but I'm assuming your device is one of the devices that it said bye bye to, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the Sonos users as a, as a group, I mean, it literally lit up my social network with unhappy Sonos users. So I forgot where I saw this, but I, I was having a hard time understanding it because I was like, wait, are all of these Sonos early adopter audio files tweeting about this from their iPhone 11s? <laughs> like, are, are these the same people who also opt into systems that basically force them to update hardware or buy new hardware every 12 to 18 months? Because that feels like very hypocritical. So I think the answer is absolutely. So 
uh, without insulting any of my friends, I mean, if you were to line up 20 people you know and say how many of them are Sonos users, you would be able to know, you know, they tend to be people of, you know, I mean, they want to play with new toys, they value the, the audio quality, but they also like, it's a little like the people that have sub-zero fridges in their house. Mm -hmm. Like, like why, I don't, I mean, I guess it's a better fridge than a non-sub-zero fridge, but it's definitely also a brand, right? It's like... This was all, this all could have been avoided. Like, this is, this is the brilliance of Apple, and this is the stupidity of Sonos. Not that I'm, like, the world's smartest marketing person, but, like, it, the entire messaging around the Sonos update was basically posited as removing value, from the customer. And if you look at every Apple announcement, it's basically talking about upgrading in service of making your experience better. Now, Sonos gets credit. They 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 heard the the roar of the crowd and they essentially caved. Uh, the CEO sent out an email to anyone that they had an email address. I'm sure you got one and said, "We're sorry. We fucked up. We we take it back." We're gonna, we're gonna, we're not gonna backwardly, backwardsly compatibilize. That's not a phrase. Um, <laughs> the new software, but we are going to, we're gonna support and debug and keep secure the old hardware. Yeah. Although even that email was a little bit like. Again, it was so unnecessary, right? Like we never got an email from IE6. We just started upgrading our browsers over time, and like, as a consumer, we like I don't know about you, but. I never have an expectation that I can start airdropping files to my original like Apple devices. It's like those are so legacy. So again, they just they shot themselves in the foot twice. Both twice. feet. Literally yeah. twice. Yeah. And and the second and the second and the email that came out even that kind of said, "Well, we're going to continue to support the legacy devices for an undefined period of time." Like, yeah. really? You know what about specificity? Five years. Make up a number. No, it, it was um, it was a it was not, but 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 it was more than a PR fail. It really was. I mean, I think your point is exactly right, which is, you know, there was a way to say to so so how old is your speaker? Probably five years old. Five years, five, right? Years. So th so there was a way to say to you, hey Alexa. You've had a speaker for the last five years. We hope you've had it. Th thought it was great. The new one that's coming out is three ninety nine as opposed to five ninety nine. And you know we're gonna give you twenty percent off for being a long. You know there was a million ways they. Could oh my gosh! It. You, if they told me, trade in your speaker, and then you're gonna get a hundred dollars knocked off the new magical device that's the latest greatest hotness in the world of audio hardware, I probably bought it, would have bought into that. Yeah. They would have gotten great PR and more sales. Yeah. But instead, they're just getting pissed off customers and bad PR. So Sonos gets, so, so angry but entitled customers get an A for the day for rising up and beating the company back into submission. That being said, the lawsuit really is, it's all about the lawsuit. It's about, yeah. I mean, if you're the CEO of Sonos and I don't know his or her name, you you've got a really tricky walk that you got to walk now where you got to get new customers you got to get revenue you probably have to get another round of financing and you have and to you sue poke the bear. and you poke the bear and by the way even though you didn't sue amazon the reality is you probably made it clear that th they're going to get sucked into this one way or another so yeah all right so m moving on to something completely different let's talk about voting so this is a story that that showed up on your radar, and I think we might see it differently. Um, hmm. So, w this is a smiley face next to your notes, or a sad face? Actually, it's like a. This is interesting. Okay. It's, it was a. I think we have talked about misinformation. We've talked about the election and how to secure the integrity of the democratic process. And so, when I saw this headline, I was like, hmm. Seattle is trying to do something different. They're trying to, King, King County, uh, Washington, which is where Seattle is, um, is going to be the first area in the U.S. where residents can vote via smartphones. And when I think about voter suppression, how to engage constituents and get them to the polls, I'm like, you know what? 
maybe that is a great idea because we have fingerprint technology and uh, sitting on my couch and voting seems a lot more convenient than walking 500 feet to my nearest polling location, which is, which is true if you live in, uh, in New York because there literally is a polling place. On every block. <laughs> so so I, I thought we might disagree, and we do, in fact. I think this is a terrible idea. I think this is abhorrently terrible. Okay. Uh, um, I'm, I'm totally game to hear that. All right, let's just start with what I think is the obvious problem here, which is, you know, poor people don't, you know, you don't, when, you know, when you graduate, well, graduate's a bad example. When, you know, when you, when you reach a certain age, you're not gifted a government-issued smartphone so not only do you have to have the money to buy one and they're not cheap but on top of that you've got to pay the monthly fee and then not that's not cheap either so if you're somebody working a minimum wage job you know i mean i i don't know what the stats are but let's assume that 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 the number of middle income and wealthy people that have cell phones is that don't have smartphones is near zero Mm -hmm. right and the people who are poor or underprivileged or working at the poverty line, some percentage of them, let's say 15% or 20, but not zero, don't have them. So you're automatically disenfranchising some chunk of the bottom half of the economic underprivileged. And that's terrible. Yep. Um, and, and even if you came up with a government program that said for anyone that's going to vote and doesn't have a phone will have a computer set up at the polling i don't even know how that would work but but you know the problem is that the the 2016 badness that happened around digital in the election there's no evidence that it's been fixed in any way shape or form so we're you know the battle in 2020 is going to be about you know people being excluded from voting about you know electronic ballots being screwed with about hacking into election systems. I mean, there's, there's going to be a, you could you could write the stories now that are going to come out in November about the Chinese built voting machines and the one family that built half. You know, there's all kinds of terrible voting irregularities around digital voting machines. So to me, this is even like like the, everyone I know that wants to fix things is starting with a paper ballot. Mm -hmm. Like, let's go back to what the things we can count and touch. Yeah. So so I I think this is. Mm -hmm. I don't fully disagree. Also, I just looked it up. One in nine uh, Seattle residents live in poverty. So that's. Um, yeah. yeah. So what your your point is is a valid one. And I mean, again, I. By the I way, it, it was an in, it's an interesting experiment. And when I think about all of the challenges with it. Again, where my mind goes is like, oh, you know, this is actually where open source technology matters because when you have open source code, it's actually it's public, right? You actually see how the software is written, how it can be compromised, and it's an aspect of like transparency that can potentially be used to weaponize or corrupt uh, the system. But I I have no doubt that there is an electronic version in our future with a lot of fairness built into it. But right now, given what's at stake, it seems like an odd time to be playing with. And by the way, you could argue that all kinds of other services leave poor and disenfranchised by the side of the road, you know, all, you know, government services, you know, being able to, you know, log into this or register for that, or, you mm -hmm. know, you know, get food stamps or get Medicaid or all those things increasingly require you to be computer savvy. That being said, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving Seattle a big thumbs down. Uh, I think I, I understand why it's an experiment, but I still think it's terrible. Um, having said that, um, there, there are, there are things about it that I think are worthy of enthusiasm yeah i mean i think again this might not be the solution but anything that it's funny from a voter suppression standpoint again assuming that someone has a smartphone and is maybe working two jobs where they can't get to their oh. local polling i'm like oh that feels like it that's a way to reach people i buy that yeah all right so so 
electronic by the way but as with but you you could argue this about all the things that the internet has unleashed in the last 10 years like it should net net take us to a good place of more connectedness and more democratization of voices and it just may be that along the way um we drive off the road and never actually get there <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well it's like, it, i mean the central question can we trust technology is one of the themes of this entire show Indeed it is. Um, all right, so let's move on to chapter three um, because it's it, it it's our always uh, sci-fi place. Um, mm -hmm. So as I was reading this article about essentially augmented reality and contact lenses, I found myself thinking, oh my God, putting something in front of my eyes so that it changes the way my body interacts with the world, that would be terrible unless you count my glasses, which are mm -hmm. in fact, you know, really, so, so I'm already wearing technology on my face all day. Yeah. So I have recently been, have you ever considered LASIK by the way? Never, not, hasn't even crossed my, the idea of something laser like going in my eyes so that maybe I can see better or be blind. No, not for a moment. So this is where we, where we differed on Seattle yeah. and electronic voting via smartphone you and I are definitely same wavelength because these glasses are like never coming off. Like I, I've worn contact lenses on and off for years, but I'm super freaked out by like LASIK and having my eye sliced. Yeah. But the human eye as technology is incredible. And the medical advances, like the fact that LASIK is what, a three, three to $5,000 procedure for what it does is incredible and the fact that like our glasses now i mean you have companies like warby parker where it's a hundred dollars i used to pay i don't know four or five hundred dollars for glasses yeah. like it's so yeah, so, so that's, that's all the advancement i need personally so so this is a company called mojo vision and they're unveiling a working prototype of ar contact lenses L let's just imagine for a moment what might be in front of you when you're like I already feel that way about about AirPods, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, essentially I'm listening, you know, when I, I still am, we've talked about this before, but I still struggle with when I walk into a store and I shut the sound off so I'm actually listening to the person who's in front of me, do I feel an obligation to take them out so that they don't wonder if I'm like... Yeah, there's social cues, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea that I could be looking at you shaking your hand, saying, nice to see you, nice to meet you, but actually watching a movie or looking at my email or looking at, you know, directions for how to get to the next location I'm going to project it over my, I mean, to me, the UI or the, the, the interface and how that behaves and where my attention goes, um, it, it could be a fabulous resource or a terrible fail. So, so did you uh, trial the Google Glass when it was I available? Have, I should actually, I should have taken it down. I could have had it in front of me. Yes, I, I, I have it about three feet from me. So I, I did the Google Glass. I did the Snapchat lenses too, and I, I can, o I can only opt into the fun use cases of this technology. Like I, I do think from an entertainment standpoint, it's great. I think when you're driving. Right. Not having to rely on a GPS and just sort of seeing additional directions in your line of sight versus periphery like that makes sense. But I can't I don't know. I, it's hard. It's hard to see ha -ha, uh, a world where <laughs> there's this like permanent filter that is overlaying digital things all the time. Yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel that way. The only Apple product I've never felt a pang to buy is the Apple Watch because I just can't figure out socially how you would do this in a meeting or at a dinner and not look like you were uh, like to me that social cue means I'm tired of what I'm doing and I want to see what time it is so I can leave. So I thought that too. I still do. But I recently spoke to a friend who works in real estate and he's so glued to his phone. And so the Apple Watch is actually his way to sort of untether himself from the phone. 
I was at a meeting the other day where someone had an Apple Watch, and they it was the first time in a meeting that I like the first time he looked at his watch, I thought he was being rude because obviously he we were boring him, and then by the third time I realized he was just checking his mail. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm cautiously optimistic about the augmented real, reality contact lenses um, because I I think there's a lot of data we're creating that it doesn't have a good interface, which is why I, I like the Google Glass theoretically mm -hmm. and then in practice, not so much. I mean, I think for uh, people who have lost vision or visually impaired, this technology can be life changing in the same way that um, NLP, natural language processing, for uh, is also really powerful for people who aren't as mobile, can't type on their computer, et cetera. Um, I mean, just imagine, right? You To have technology that can augment your vision and help you interact with the world better, amazing, right? So For certain so, people. So you're saying if there was a demo mm -hmm. at South By this year, you'd, you'd go check it out? Sure, yeah. All but right. Again, it's, I, it's the type of technology that I don't necessarily see as appealing for the masses like for the everyday consumer but i can see it being so incredible and life-changing for the people who really need it so so um we won't talk about it on the show today just because we don't have enough time but i hosted a event in brooklyn around ai and local news and yeah, you know, what was fascinating about the conversation for a couple of days was that ai is both the, the great white hope that solves problems for journalists, and it's also the enemy that potentially eats their lunch. And yep. so, so I told a story on stage and I said, you know, I was setting my alarm, I had to be up early the other day to go to get in a car for an event I was going to. And um, I was I ordered the car and my phone said, you should set an alarm that's early or something like that. And I thought, that's odd. And I kind of projected forward what happens when you get in your Tesla and you say, Tesla, take me to the pizza parlor. And your car says, actually, Steve, I noticed you got on the scale this morning. You've added a little bit of weight. I think I'm going to take you to the gym instead. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's your car driving you to the gym as opposed to the pizza parlor. And like, mm -hmm. like, so there's this funny line that we're in, I think, in the early days of where this, you know, the computer is a tool. The computer is a friend. The computer helps you. The computer tells you, no, that's a dangerous, unhealthy thing you're going to do. I'm not taking you there. You right. Know? I, you know, or I would highly recommend we stop at, you know, you know, it's so-and-so's birthday. Shouldn't we stop at the flower shop? I'm right there. I can pull over. Like, like, you know, none of that seems out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. I mean, I think with every sort of just disruptive technology like um it forces us to evaluate our values wait, wait. and how we want to live i'll give you a great example when facebook tells you that somebody's birthday and now i think it's linkedin suggests a bunch of answers mm -hmm. congratulations new job you know it gives you three or four answers and, yeah. you, and and my immediate reaction is i'm not using those built-in canned answers but then i look at them and they're all pretty close to what i was going to write yes so, Google is the best for Gmail. Yeah. Gmail, I think, has the best canned responses. So, but do you still fight against that and say, no, I'm going to write my own words. I'm typing my own words, even if they're the same. Congratulations, exclamation point. I definitely have a thing where I might use it, but then I add my own personal note. I don't that, know. That's By the way, that, that's really sweet of you. I wonder how long that lasts in real life. I mean, if, yeah, it's... Technology is changing so fast. It doesn't even, by the time we actually decide what the etiquette is and what the rule books are, you know, there's something else that we have to, to change and learn. Yeah. And with that, we are out of time. An excellent show started on a, on a somber note, but then we brought it up at the end. Good for us. <laughs> Always a blast, Steve. <laughs> See you in a week. All right. Bye.